Amen. Book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Amen. So my message title today is from a language that you don't speak. And so if you look at the word bara and say, I have no idea what that means, it's because you aren't necessarily supposed to know what it means yet. But today we're going with the help of the Lord to talk about the Hebrew word bara. Amen. Uh, Pastor Craig, would you pray for us here today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Yes, God, pray that you speak into our hearts and lives, Lord Jesus, God, for your work to be done. Amen. Amen. Human beings are incredibly good at making things. Our ability to fashion tools and to dream up plans is unique amongst God's creation. And there are some incredibly gifted animal species and often we're delighted at what they are able to accomplish. But let's be clear, nothing compares to humanity amongst right. God's creation uh, for their ability to, uh, to create, to design, to build. I have seen, maybe you have before, a video of a, har a tree harvester. And when I say a tree harvester, harvester. I'm not talking about a person. I'm talking about a massive machine that can go into a swath of heavy forest where you have trees the size of which you couldn't wrap your arms around or several people wrap their arms around. And if you were going back to the days where you were using some kind of saw or axe, it would be an all day job, if not more, to take that tree down and then to cut it up into a useful material. Look, but I have seen a video of the machine in under a minute. Uh, it cuts the tree down. Uh, it trims off the branches. It sections it down uh, into the appropriate size logs, all of which in under a minute. There are some tools that you discover along the way that can really turn a labor-intensive job into something simple. I've done things the hard way before, and, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you, I... Um, when I uh, first came here, Brother Kingsley was pretty old school when it came to screwdrivers. And so he believed that a screwdriver is something with a handle on it and you turn it. And so I, I bought into that philosophy for a season. And I have cranked uh, many screws by hand. Uh, but I'll tell you, I have got a uh, Milwaukee M18 fuel uh, driver out there that will put a four-inch screw through a stud in a matter of seconds. And I don't know how long it would take me to hand crank that thing in there. Uh, but I'll tell you this, it would be a whole lot longer uh, than a matter of seconds. And I'd be worn out uh, after doing about five or six of them uh, at the end of the day. And so tools can do something uh, amazing. Uh, we had to move our LVL beams for uh, the, uh, what we're going to put to support the roof here in the section of the washrooms and the offices. Uh, and so it was a load of 40 beams, 20 feet long. Uh, and the total weight was somewhere close to 5,000 pounds. Uh, now, we could have moved all of those by hand. But Brother Shane got out there with the backhoe. Uh, and uh, he got the forks under that load uh, and brought them up into the sanctuary. Uh, there was a point where it did get a little tippy. And uh, one end of the backhoe went, the back end went. Mm -hmm. And we all go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But we got the load down, and that thing moved all of those in a matter of minutes. It's amazing what a piece of machinery can do. When we needed to put those steel purlins up in the top of the building, we used a lift to hoist those steel beams almost 27 feet into the air. And I'll tell you, as far as the work I was putting in, it was effortless to lift them up there and to put them into place. And so we have the ability to create machinery, and what we're talking about is small scale stuff. Uh, if you've ever looked at the machinery that they use out in the oil sands in Alberta for example, uh, it is astonishing uh, how big and powerful these machines are uh, that is working in the worst of conditions often uh, but getting the job done. Uh, 
When I look at all that we've had to do to build our little project here, it just blows my mind all the more when you start to talk about great human achievements. Uh, today, uh, Terry's been living the last couple of years in Dubai, and it seems like every week uh, there is some new kind of monument popping up in Dubai, and the tallest of those is the Burj Khalifa, which is nearly 3,000 feet high. It's close to a kilometer high. Uh, it is more than twice the height, more than twice the height of the Empire State building. It is an actual building with floors almost all the way up that is a thousand feet taller than the CN Tower, if you can imagine that. And even in the midst of all the high rises there, you can see the spire as it shoots up uh, high into the sky. And I watched a documentary about uh, how they have to, uh, the pressure required to get water all the way up to the top floor where the, you know, where the executives have their suites or there is high end restaurants way up there. Uh, and they had to have special code uh, to try to develop and so that they could run, you know, their, their ability to cook up there and all of those things. Uh, you don't think about all that. It's not just building a structure. Uh, it's solving all the problems to do the things we want to do uh, way up there. Uh, it's an incredible, incredible thing. Uh, the Confederation Bridge that connects uh, PEI to New Brunswick, it blows my mind. It is a curved two-lane highway that goes straight over the Atlantic Ocean for nearly 13 kilometers. It is the world's longest bridge over ice-covered waters. You talk about a bridge over troubled waters. And most of the bridge is 40 meters. That's 131 feet above the water. But there are spans that are nearly 60 meters, about 200 feet above water to allow shipping traffic to go underneath. And so you are way up above the ocean driving on a road that goes over the ocean even in winter with ice coming underneath that connects the island to the province of New Brunswick. I can't even imagine the engineering that goes in trying to set the piers down on the seabed to support something like that uh, and to make it stable against all of those forces. Uh, but that is an incredible, incredible achievement. Uh, you can go back to things or in earlier ages, like going back over 5,000 years ago uh, to the Great Pyramid of Giza, which has some 2.3 million stones in it. It's nearly 500 feet tall, uh, and yet it still stands nearly 5,000, oh, over 5,000 years later. That is simply incredible. It is the oldest of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And it's the only one that's left standing today. But almost more amazing are the tiny things. We can design nanobots so small that they cannot be seen with the naked eye. Microprocessors that drive pretty much everything to your, from your iPhone to your car. They once were able to fit 2,300 transistors onto that little microchip. Now... Where it used to, they used to be able to fit 2,300. They're able to fit 57 billion transistors onto the same space. I last researched this in 2016, and the number at that point was 2.6 billion transistors. So from 2016 till now, uh, we have gone from being able to fit 2.6 billion uh, to 57 billion transistors uh, on the same space. Man has shown an incredible ability to build on both the big and the small scale. But there is one thing we humans require to make anything. No matter how big, no matter how small, we need materials. Whether it's the size of a cell or a slab of rock weighing many tons, we need raw materials you see, the one thing that we have never yet discovered and never will is how to make something out of nothing. See, there was a scientist that approached God and said to him, God, hey, we don't really need you anymore. We can do all kinds of sorts of things today that used to be considered miraculous. We can transplant organs. We can give new life to a dying man. We can cure almost any disease, <coughs> except COVID apparently. And we can even clone animals. <laughs> It won't be long, but we'll be able to clone humans too. So, I'm sorry, God. You're just a little outdated. So God listened patiently to the scientist and said, 
I see that you believe you don't need me. And I understand. However, since I love you and I don't want you to make a big mistake, why don't we make sure? I say we'll have a man-making contest, just to be sure. Scientist says, okay, I'll take on that challenge. So God says, all right, let's, let's do it the way that I did back in the beginning with Adam and Eve. And the scientist says, no problem. And he reaches down to grab a handful of dirt. And God says, uh, wait a minute. You get your own dirt. <laughs> See, there's the fundamental problem right there. We can make great things, but we can't make great things without something to begin with. Uh, we require the building blocks to build with. Uh, you see, for example, that God was impressed with the building accomplishments uh, of uh, Nimrod and the people at Babel. Uh, and so, uh, Bible says in Genesis 11 and 3, uh, Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So both at the first Babel and later on at Babylon, uh, people were amazed at the building that was accomplished using fired bricks. Uh, and they would fire these bricks and they would glaze them into beautiful colors. Uh, at some points, the walls around Babylon were a hundred feet tall uh, and wide enough for chariots to pass along the top. Uh, the Ishtar Gate was one of the wonders of the world along with the Hanging Gardens. Uh, and they were beautiful and they were Miraculous, And the Bible notes the original problem where they were, uh, which remained later on at Babylon, and that is that they didn't have a regular supply of stone nearby. And so they innovated, and humans are good at innovation. That's human ingenuity. They innovated by taking uh, the clay that was in the area and firing it with, uh, with, with fire, and they found uh, that they had asphalt. There was, as there still is today in the Middle East, uh, there was a lot of uh, seepage of uh, petroleum products, and so they used and created a mortar. Uh, all of that is impressive, and God was impressed at what they were accomplishing. But I do point out, they may have not had stone and they used brick instead, but they had to get the clay and the mortar from somewhere. They had to start with something that God had made. We find later on in Exodus, Exodus chapter 5 and verse 6, and it's right in the beginning stages of when God has sent Moses back to command Pharaoh to let his people go. And so the initial response was is that Pharaoh tried to intimidate Moses and the Hebrews and tried to drive a wedge between them, and he focused on the building supplies. So on the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers, saying, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them the quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it. For they are idle, therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men, that they may labor in it, and let them not regard false words. And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get yourselves straw where you can find it, yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble, Instead of straw. As I've already noted, ancient Egypt built some of the most amazing wonders uh, of antiquity. And uh, not just the pyramids that I talked about, but there are treasure cities and monuments, uh, some of which were built by Hebrew slave labor uh, that were equally impressive. But this illustrates, this story illustrates how that a supply chain issue, no straw to make the brick caused panic among the Hebrews. Uh, at this point, I think they were probably a well-oiled machine, uh, pumping out the bricks, uh, building what needed to be done, but disrupt that supply chain issue, uh, take away a building ingredient, uh, and all of a sudden, they had major, major problems. You see, man can build great things, but we require the materials to do so. On Tuesday of this week, a total of three trucks delivered load after load of building materials into our new building. Wood studs, plywood, vapor barrier, nails and screws, beams and more. We were ready to uh, hashtag build the church. But we also have to face the reality of any human building endeavor. You can have all the passion to build in the world. 
but you can't build without building materials. Mm -hmm. One of the great challenges in this building process, because God chose this of all times uh, for us to be building, thanks a lot, Lord. It's been, uh, but the great challenge has been getting those materials because of skyrocketing cost and supply chain issues and all of those things. It doesn't matter what trade it is and who you're talking to. They'll say uh, it's been uh, so hard to get materials and costs have skyrocketed up. And it's like, oh, thanks, Lord, thanks. Uh, but you can have an architectural plan and you can even have willing builders. But if you don't have building materials, you go nowhere. I'll confess to having some sleepless nights over these kinds of worries. For as a human, I struggle with looking at a situation and evaluating and seeing what is missing. You see, if you can't see the building blocks to build, whether it's in the natural or in a spiritual or an emotional situation, uh, if it's one thing if you can look around and say, yeah, I've got a problem, uh, but I see the materials required to fix the problem. Uh, I can, uh, it may take some time and some effort, uh, but I can resolve this. Uh, but if the building blocks aren't there, if you evaluate a situation uh, and you see no hope, uh, you see no potential way forward, uh, that's when you're struggling. Stress starts to mount. Uh, that's when fear starts to grip your heart. Uh, and this is typical of so many problems that you and I face. Perhaps it's an addiction that we ourselves or someone that we love is bound by. And try as we might, we cannot even see the basic ingredients for deliverance. I've tried to walk a few steps with people, with families that are in this situation, uh, whether it's the individual themselves uh, or to someone that cares about someone that they see destroyed. Uh, and one of the things that makes them feel so hopeless uh, is when they look at the situation uh, and they evaluate it uh, and they see no possibility uh, for deliverance or change. Uh, experience says uh, that there's going to be a certain cycle that looks something like uh, one step forward and then two steps steps back uh, and they've seen that repeat again and again uh, programs have failed uh, good intentions have fallen by the wayside uh, and as you look at the situation all you see is nothing nothingness no hope perhaps it's a besetting sin that you're struggling with right now you need to build a wall against that temptation that you can't seem to build or to beat but time and again the basic building blocks are missing. There seems to be nothing you can lay your hands to that seem to help. And you feel paralyzed. You want to change. You want to do different. But you find yourself repeating the same pattern. And nothing seems to work. Or maybe it's a broken down relationship. A breach that you would like to repair. A, a bridge that has fallen. Someone that you care about. Uh, that seems to be a great gulf away from you. Uh, and the relationship has crumbled to the place uh, where it seems irredeemable. Uh, but it leaves such a gaping wound within your heart. Uh, and you want to uh, repair the breach. Uh, you want to build the bridge. But it seems like there's nothing there uh, to build upon. Uh, everything is shattered. And broken. Or maybe you have that hunger and desire to live for God. But it seems like you lack even the basic skills to do it. Uh, there is a passion in your heart. Uh, there is something that beats to know the Lord. Uh, but you find again and again that there is nothing in you uh, that seems to be the kind of quality needed uh, to really serve the Lord and do something for Him. Uh, and you look around and it seems like all you got is nothing. And it is in the void of emptiness, of nothingness, where doubt starts to sink. It's in the blackness of depression, the gloom of anxiety, the void of despair, where we start to spiral and we start to sink. Our faith flickers and dies because we see no building blocks for bettering ourselves, of taking charge of our situation. We're looking for the light at the end of the tunnel, but all we see is blackness. And it's for this reason, the fact that you and I, we live in a real world and we deal with real stuff, 
This is not some kind of superficial pretend church where we show up and we plaster a smile on our face and we act like we've got it all together and that everything is perfect. Uh, but I know the reality uh, and you know the reality. We're real people uh, and we live in a real community uh, and we have real jobs and real families uh, and we go through real stuff. Uh, I'd like to be able to preach some kind of prosperity doctrine to you uh, that says if you become a Christian, it'll solve all your problems uh, and you'll never get sick and you'll always have lots of money uh, and always your relationships will be fantastic uh, but that's not the reality uh, there are people sitting here right now uh, that are going through brokenness and family relationships uh, there are people right now that are dealing uh, with being on the brink of financial ruin uh, there are people right now that are dealing with health problems uh, and addiction problems uh, and sin problems uh, this is the real world and this is where we are uh, and and sometimes uh, we can feel overwhelmed uh, as if things will never be better uh, and we will never see or know joy once again. Uh, it all seems dark and empty and void. But here's where I want to remind you of our text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Uh, the Bible describes a state of affairs uh, that is just like what you may be feeling inside today. Uh, there is no form, uh, no order. It's chaos. Uh, it is dark uh, and it is void. Uh, it seems like there is nothing, uh, no hope. Uh, but the Spirit of God was there uh, hovering over the face of the waters. Uh, then God said let there be light and there was light you see God started working in the darkness in the void in the formless blackness where there was no building blocks there was no materials there was no planet that just needed a bit of a fixer upper there was no house that just needed a renovation there were no building materials of any kind there was nothing to form together uh, but in that moment uh, the Bible says that God uh, created uh, the word uh, Hebrew word is bara and it is similar to the Latin phrase uh, ex nihilo uh, which means from nothing uh, God started with nothing uh, he stood against the backdrop of emptiness uh, of the void uh, of the blackness uh, and he said let there be light uh, he he stood up against nothing and said, there shall be something. He spoke matter into existence uh, where any other being uh, would have been powerless uh, because of a lack of materials uh, in that kind of situation uh, God was perfectly uh, at home uh, God arrived at a job site uh, that was just a void and black uh, there's no materials uh, there's no light uh, there's nothing to work with uh, and God says perfect uh, this is where I can get started uh, he was perfectly at home uh, he is the the first and only to begin a grand building project with nothing at all. No tools, no materials, nothing. The blackness of the void was his job site. No materials in sight, no tools, and God cracks his knuckles and says, all right, let's get her done. And in these very first words of Scripture is found the most powerful of revelation. And it is this. God is not limited by anything. God has no problem with nothing. You see, we are overwhelmed when we have nothing to work with. We are overwhelmed when it seems like we have nothing to get started with. But nothing, nothing 
is a perfectly acceptable building material uh, for God. Uh, and I want to get it into your head right now uh, and into your heart. Uh, you may have nothing, uh, nothing to offer God, uh, nothing to give God, uh, nothing to work with. Uh, but what I tell you today uh, is that nothing uh, is a perfectly acceptable building material uh, for God. Uh, he doesn't need anything to work with. Uh, he doesn't need to start off uh, with a nice supply of materials. Uh, he doesn't need you to be good uh, or to have your act together. Uh, he doesn't need you to have things all figured out uh, or your ducks in a row. Uh, you can bring your chaos uh, and your void uh, and your blackness to him. Uh, and he says, uh, that's a great place uh, for me to start. Uh, I don't need anything uh, to start with. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand uh, that the worlds were framed uh, by the word of God. So that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. Uh, we piled all that wood out there uh, so we could start to frame something this week. Uh, but I tell you, when God framed the world, uh, he framed them by his word alone. Uh, no materials, uh, no supplies, uh, not even any sun as a work light. Uh, he just said, uh, let there be light. Uh, and he began to speak uh, something uh, out of nothing. Uh, in that moment he created uh, Bara. Out of nothing uh, he began to create uh, and he spoke uh, and the visible was formed from the invisible. So I say this as I come to a close. If God can make the universe out of nothing then don't tell me he can't build something out of your nothingness. He already made a universe. And all that is therein. Out of nothing. And so you say. In hopelessness and defeat. God I have nothing. To give to you. I have nothing. To offer. And you think in that moment. That God's response is going to be to turn his back. And to walk away. But what I'm telling you today. Is that God looks at an offer of nothing. And he says, perfect. That's all I need. Right now the void may be looming. Threatening to overwhelm you in your life right now. You may look around and see no hope. You may see only nothingness. But nothing is a perfectly suitable building material. I want you to know right now, whatever your situation is, yes. and you know right now as I'm preaching, there is something that is going off like a klaxon in your head right now. Uh, something that you're dealing with, whether it's health or addiction or sin, uh, a family crises, whatever it is, there is something that's going off in your mind. Uh, it's the thing that has given you the sleepless nights, uh, that has made you feel overwhelmed. Uh, but I'm telling you right now, whatever that thing is uh, that you have been afraid uh, to bring it to God because it seems seems like it's impossible. Uh, don't worry. Uh, with God, uh, all things are possible. Uh, with God, all things are possible. Uh, and I want to challenge you right now to stand uh, and uh, take hold of that thing uh, that is tearing you apart right now. Uh, and I want to uh, invite you to come and bring it to God. Uh, bring your nothingness uh, to God right now and say, God, uh, I don't have anything to offer you. Uh, all I've got is brokenness uh, and void. But God, I believe uh, that you can take this chaos uh, and you can create order. Uh, you can take my nothing uh, and you can create something beautiful.